All right. Yes. Early, but let's do this. Let's, uh, yeah, sorry. Still running a little bit behind, so bear with me. I'm going to do that. Why didn't that work, you son of a bitch? Okay, I'll deal with that later. And we're going to press this button. Awesome. Oh. And now we'll see how good you are. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Ready to work. All right, here we are. So this is uh, this is not the writer's chat. That's tomorrow. Today, now, here, this is... A workshop, but this isn't a workshop like I normally do. We're not talking about a single genre. We're not talking about some basic writer stuff. We're going to come at this from a position where the writing's done, where the book is made a book, or the thing you're going to sell, because normally I talk to writers, but the thing you're going to sell is made. You've got the photos, you've made the art, you've done X, you've done Y, you've done Z, whatever it is, and now it's time to sell. And we're going to assume you have some kind of platform. We are going to assume that you have a newsletter or a blog or a website or a social media th- the site you like, whether it's Blue Sky or, or for some reason you're still on Twitter or you've got some avenue by which you're going to talk to people, whatever it is. It doesn't at this particular moment for the thing we're going to talk about tonight It does not particularly matter because tonight we're going to talk about the six kinds of customers of uh, you can classify any kind of customer for any kind of thing into usually one of six types. We're going to talk about each of those types and we're going to talk about how to engage with them and what you can do with them and what you should know about and what you should avoid or in or double down with and Sometimes some, some of the ways this information gets taught is through a very like specific way. Like the only way to engage with type, this type of customer is to act in this certain way. And that's inaccurate. That's wrong. It, it doesn't work like that. It's not going to work like that. You can engage with these people in any number of ways. It doesn't need to be an elaborate, complicated passage of 15 emails back and forth and then you know fingers crossed this thing happens and it doesn't need to be this sort of elaborate production it just needs to be a kind of conversation held between you and the customer whomever they might be now that might mean in order to engage with some of these people you have to do more than just like tweet once or post a single like two sentence statement somewhere. You're going to have to work a little bit for this. I'm sorry. I know that's shitty. I know it's unfair. I know it's not right, but that's, that's how this goes. You're going to have to put in a little bit of effort and we could put in less effort if we did some, you know, dismantling of various things like capitalism. But for now we're going to have to do some work to get this stuff done. I've got, Six groups of people to talk about. Um, I can't tell for whatever reason. I can't seem to tell who, if I have an audience, if at all, uh, who's here. So if you're watching this live, hello, please let me know you're here in chat. Otherwise, uh, this might be like real brief if I'm just going to rip through these one at a time. Uh, Otherwise, if you're here and you have questions, please, oh, please, oh, please ask. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, the next day when this gets posted and you've got questions, go ask them down in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them. Hi. Hello, person who I don't entirely know. It's nice to see you. Uh, Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, What can I call you? So I don't have to keep calling you, you person, but um, thanks for being here. This is going to be good. Uh, If you have no idea what this is, if you've never been here before, I should probably introduce myself. I'm John. 
Hi, it's nice to meet you. Uh, it's my job to help people generally write better, although it's also my job to help creatives be more creative and accomplish their creative goals. Uh, I am a full-time writing coach and occasional creative coach. Uh, it seems to be kind of blending the two together, and it's, it's my job to help you succeed at whatever you want to produce or make or do. That's what I love to do. I've been doing it for 20 years. Hi, Gabriel. It's so nice to meet you. Um, are we ready to do this? Shall we go? Let's do this. Up first. First kind of customer that we're going to run into. Awesome. Thank you for following. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. I know how bloated uh, Twitch can get. So I appreciate the follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First kind of customer. The do it now. That's not really their name. If you want their technical name, like if you ever go to like a bar trivia night and someone's like, name a type of customer, this is the active engaged customer. But that sounds really like awful. And I want to make it sound like regular people using regular words. So I call them the do it now people. And you can think about the do it now people as the customer who does it right now. So they're the customer that when you say, I have X, I have a book, I have pictures, I have this, I have that, whatever it is, the minute you make available to them, make them aware of it, and then say, hey, go to this link and click it and, and get it, or you know, Venmo me, PayPal me, whatever me, X amount of dollars, come get it, they will do it. All they need to do is be told. Tell them about X, X being the thing we're selling. And this is a, an example of direct sales. We are selling directly to them. There's no intermediary. There's no real kind of waiting around. It's just, hey, you want to buy a thing? You like this? Here to go. Go here, click this, do this. However, something to keep in mind. In getting to them straight away, you Aren't, it, it isn't like, go buy this, and then you get quiet. Don't you, you can't just like put the link out and disappear. That doesn't work here. You need to have some kind of strong sales pitch. Now, if we're talking about something like photos or video, that can do, you have to be direct. This is, well, direct sales, that's a good question, Gabriel. It's direct sales in the sense of you are selling directly to them. There's no like, go here, sign up, and then when, the, when pigs fly, you'll get your email. It is direct to the customer. That is what direct sales mean. You can be direct in your way you communicate to them. Hey, person, buy this thing or else. You can come across in a direct way if you want, if that's your vibe. But this is direct sales in the sense that we are not like speaking to a middleman. We're going right to the person doing the buying. And in order to engage with that person, we need to have sales copy. We need to have a sentence or two or a paragraph or a blurb or a page or some amount of text, some amount of text, more than like two words, um, to describe what it is they're buying and make that thing they're buying, whatever it is, sound like something they want. That can be a paragraph. It can be some questions. It can be a, like a really kind of, ex, you know, very explainy sort of thing. It can be anything. It just needs to be very clear. Like you can't beat around the bush about what it is. And it needs to be sort of very engaging and effective. It needs to grab the, the person's attention and, and explain like, okay, you're giving me this many dollars. You're getting this thing. One, two, three. The do it now customer doesn't have doubt. They're not kind of, sort of sure. They're not like, oh, I don't know. There's very little doubt. They want the thing, whatever it is. And they have a very high need for that thing. They want it. You are offering to them one of whatever it is, the exact things they want. You're giving it to them. So they have... No doubt and high need. And yes, Gabriel, they are spontaneous. They will act. Not necessarily like immediately. Like there might be a few minutes or 
the like if you post your thing at let's say 10 a.m and they don't see it until 6 p.m there might be that delay but the minute they see the thing will more or less be the same amount of time they react to it so you don't need to like lay an elaborate plan out you just need to know that when i say hey come buy this thing there's going to be some segment of the population the do it now customers who we're going to do a thing and because they're going to do a thing no matter what, they don't have any doubt, they need the thing you're selling or they really, 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 really want it, you don't have to get like extra flashy when we're talking to them or trying to get them to buy. We don't have to like lay out a ton of extra sales pitches. We don't have to like sweeten the deal. Ooh, if you buy X, I'll throw in this and this and this and this and this. We don't have to do any of that. You don't have to be flashy. You can be honest with them. Hey, you're giving me this many dollars. You're going to get this many things or whatever it is. Enjoy one, two, three, done. That's the do it now customer. We don't know like if they're male or female. We don't know how they identify. We don't know their age. That's all depending on the thing you're selling. It depends on who you are, how you're reaching them, where you're reaching them. There's a number of factors there, but we know that there are kinds of customers that are like this. That's customer type number one, the do it now customer. On we go to type number two. Actually, I'm going to get a mouthful of water. This is more talking than I thought. Normally when I do this workshop, it's just text and I didn't want to just write another dull newsletter. I wanted to kind of spruce it up a little bit. So I'm taking my Monday workshop spot and I'm putting this together now. On to person number two. This is me. Uh, I know this person really well because it's me. Well, I'm also some of customer number three we'll get to in a minute. But this is me. The researcher. And this is a customer who needs proof. This is a customer who needs um, evidence that uh, what you've got is good. They need evidence that what you've got does what you say it does. If you are selling a book, I don't doesn't matter what your book is, but you are going to describe your book as exciting or thrilling or sexy or interesting or good or however you want to describe your book, they need proof. They do a lot of doubting. Now, normally, these people, this kind of customer, loves and does better with reassurance where we are going to teach them something or explain something to them and then include x but if not everyone is interested to know if hang on understandable but not everyone is interested to know if something is good that is true there are different kinds of customers so you have to be think of this like tools in the toolbox right? Sometimes we need this tool out of the toolbox. Other times we need this other different tool. Sometimes we need a screwdriver. Sometimes we need a hammer. Sometimes we need a wrench. Knowing that these customer types are out there, we can address or create a different tool in order to engage with them. A different tool for a different job. For a research customer, a customer who needs a lot of proof, we are going to have to spend a little bit more time and space giving them something in addition to them making the purchase. We need to explain what's going on and we need to talk about what's so cool about what we made. We need to give them information that they didn't have. Like, hey, do you know I wrote this book in 30 days? Or, oh man, I wrote this book 10 minutes a day every morning before I went to the job that I hate. Or did you know I've considered writing this book for 10 years? Or did you know uh, that when I was taking these pictures, uh, my cat constantly kept bumping my camera? Or I love taking, I love this as my job. We have to say something to them that teaches, I'm making air quotes because we don't always have to like teach them a school thing. We don't have to be like, now we're going to learn chemistry. But we have to explore a space, explain something to them that they didn't know. And it often helps to teach them something about the thing. Like, hey, I wrote this book in 30 days. 
Or I never thought I was a person good enough to write a book and I wrote five words a day for a year and here we go. If you can teach them something and hopefully that something has to do with the book or the product or the thing, they will be more inclined to say yes. We can't always guarantee a yes, but we can certainly encourage it. Whenever possible, we can show proof, proof that it does the thing it says it does, proof that it is as good as we say it is, which means we also want to include sometimes testimonials and reviews. Oh my God, I bought this book. I can't, I want to give it to all my kids. Holy shit. I'll buy every book this author wrote for 10 years. Oh man, these photos are so cool. Reviews and testimonials from other customers are going to go a long way at making the researcher or the researcher customer type more likely to engage with the material because they'll have proof. They'll see other people having done it. They'll see data, whatever that means and whatever that might be, and they'll be able to react from it. They'll learn something they didn't know, and that will make the purchase of whatever you're selling slightly less threatening to them because it won't be like, I don't know, I'm just, am I wasting this money? You're, you're trying to comfort them with more information before they turn around and make the purchase. What that information is and how much that information, how much of that you give, that's up to you. You get to make those decisions. Maybe that's going to be like a page, a paragraph, a quick 10 second video at the top of a web page. I don't know. Maybe it's uh, just a thank you note. Something, something. It can't be silence. Something that helps give them information to encourage them to make the sale or encourage them to um, pay more attention, follow up, act. Because we're driving people to action. We're driving people to the point where, oh my God, I, I can't. I have no choice. I, I'm compelled to press the button and, and buy the thing. That's where we're aiming everybody towards. The researcher is type number two. I'm this kind of person. I need to learn stuff. I need to put stuff in my brain. It's not enough for me just to act spontaneously or quickly like type number one. I need I need material before I do it. There's lots of reasons for that. I'm insecure. Uh, I don't have a lot of money, so there's not really a lot of flexibility in my budget. So the more proof, the more info I have, the easier this is going to be, at least for me, to make a purchase unless, like, I have such an such a high need for a thing, like, oh, my God, I could really use a new vacuum cleaner. I'm not going to really dawdle around the data around vacuums. I'm going to take action. But most of the time, proof is my friend. That's type number two. On we go to type number three. Type number three is also me. Ooh. Type number three might be more me than type number two was. So here's the contrarian. This is the customer who believes they can't. This is the customer who believes that what I buy is a waste of time or it's not going to work or it worked for other people, but it won't work for me or I'm going to buy this thing and it's, it's supposed to help me or supposed to be work, like good, but I'm going to be that one person in a million automatically, no matter what, where it's going to not work because that's just my luck because I suck because whatever. The contrarian is your most negative kind of potential customer. You got to do a lot of work here. It's unfortunate. But these are the people who need a little bit more attention, for lack of a better word, in order to make this purchase. You are going to need to find a very delicate balance between challenging their objections, which means, at least in the terms of talking about their objections, understanding why they think they can't. So let's say you're selling... Let's say you're selling like a class and you've got a, like a, I don't know, a a five video class on how to, how to make pasta dinners. I'm just making something up. 
you have to anticipate how someone could say no. You might say, well, they have trouble managing recipes. So you'll talk about how the recipes are very easy to follow. Or they might talk about the price and you'll talk about how you offer payment plans or how the price is low because it's, you know, you, you do this or that. Or how they don't have a lot of time. Well, you talk about how your, your material is immediately accessible and everything is in five-minute clips or whatever. You figure out what the objections of your possible customer are, what would make them say, nah, this isn't going to work for me. This is a waste of time, a waste of money. And you, for lack of a better word, attack those positions, challenge them, make them think that possibly they're wrong, but not like in a mean way, just challenge their thinking by explaining a more, practical reality. Oh, I don't think this is going to work for me. Why not? Well, because uh, I, I don't like big, heavy, dense things to read. Okay, well, good news. This thing's real easy to read. Challenge their objections. You do not, and I cannot stress this enough, you do not have to try and convince them that you are good enough. You don't have to try and like beg them to make the sale. You don't have to like twist their arm or make this like a weird kind of pity party thing. You don't have to convert them from just a person into your bestest friend. You just need to challenge their objections. And there's something, uh, how do I say this? There's a significant thing you should know when it comes to a contrarian customer no matter the product, no matter how we engage with them. So there's something that they believe wrong. Maybe it's with them. They don't think they're good enough. Maybe it's with the, the material. They don't think they're smart. They don't think uh, that books are, you know, science, five, science fiction books are good anymore. There's some issue they have, whatever it might be. They think that no one gets them. I don't know. Some kind of issue. If you can demonstrate, even vaguely, because again, we're not in school. We're not in court. You don't have to launch into some massive issue. But if you can set up a set of conditions where you can prove that X is the solution to the problem they have, they will make the purchase. So for instance, if let's use me as an example, I'm somebody who notoriously thinks I'm not good enough and that things will not work for me because I'm not good enough. When somebody comes along offering a thing I want and they're able to tell me that even though I think I'm one of the worst people ever walk on the planet, incapable of doing anything good, if they can point out to me that even I, as bad as I might be, can benefit from whatever this thing is they're selling, I am more likely to say yes to it. Let's use an example of something that just happened like an hour before I sat down to record this. I was talking to somebody and I was expressing a little bit of fear and frustration about setting this up. I was worried that this workshop wasn't going to work because it's real short. It's really short. We're about a halfway through it now. So this might only be like 45 minutes tops, right? I was really worried that no one was going to be here and no one was going on and that this was just going to be further evidence that I'm terrible at what I do. I was really, really afraid. And they were talking to me about, hey, you know, if this, if this goes well, though, you'll get somebody will get an answer to a question. Somebody will feel more capable of, of doing what they want to do. Somebody out there will benefit from this information. And they were addressing the fear I had that no one will care and this won't work. But by addressing the fear, by turning around and saying like, oh, no, no, you can help them. They were speaking to the thing I feel is wrong and that made me more likely to engage. Oh, yeah, okay, I can help somebody. Somebody somewhere will look at this, whether it's live tonight or tomorrow on YouTube or a month down the road and go, Oh, cool. Okay. And I'll help. 
And that's, that's really all I want. I would love, you know, subscribers or followers or anything like that. That'd be great. I'm not a very good, um, streaming person. I often forget to say things like, please don't forget to like, and subscribe. I often forget that stuff. So when someone can more specifically point out, Hey, John, your information can help somebody. That's a big deal to me. Do not think that you, the writer or the creator of whatever you're selling, are automatically not good enough to challenge these people's positions and accomplish something. You can do this. It's not particularly difficult. You just need to be patient with yourself and patient with them. Because a lot of the contrarians, well, they won't they won't ultimately purchase. They'll stall out because they're, object, they're not interested in making the sale or buying the book or buying the photos or consuming the whatever. They're more interested in letting somebody know that there's something wrong. They want someone just to listen to them about how bad a person they are, how insecure they are, how the last five times they downloaded something from the internet, it was garbage or whatever. They just want somebody to go, "Uh uh-huh, that sucks, I'm really sorry, and then they'll move on. Remember that any of these customer types might not automatically convert. Convert means make a sale. They might not immediately go, ah, this person, uh, this this maker of stuff has done the exact thing. Like they've unlocked the magic code. It's not like that. They might, they might come back. It takes typically with online things somewhere between three and eight times being exposed to material. So like you might hear about my stuff two, three, four times. You might check it out once and then hear about it later or see it retweeted or whatever. You might need three to eight instances of exposure before you even consider making a sale. It just takes time. This is not one of those things where, you know, we have to sell 50 books by the end of Monday, so we're just going to post once and walk away. This is a situation where we are going to know that this is a regular fire, a regular thing we will need to fuel to help it move forward. And then what we're going to work with is a consistent level of, okay, sometimes this material is going to aim for these people, and sometimes it's going to aim for those people. And when we're talking to contrarians, we're not going to sweat the do it now people because they're already going to do it. So I don't need to like try and make all sales copy fit all people. We just need to aim and pick our spots. That's, that's your power. We'll talk about that in a bit as soon as we get back through um, the other three types. Overall, each type is individual. It might be Uh, Somebody might overlap and be a little bit of this and a little bit of that, like me. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But the point is, if you know sort of the way to reach them, you will, you know, with practice, you'll eventually reach them. Why don't we go to the next one? The Worrier. Before therapy and before a lot of, like, real hardcore work, I used to be a worrier. Shocking, I know. But the worrier is a customer that uh, doesn't want to be disappointed. They don't want to feel like they've wasted their time. They don't want to feel like they've wasted money. They don't want to feel like what you promised was too good to be true. This is a really common thing with authors where they will talk about their books as though their book is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Holy shit, you will never have to read another fantasy novel because you read mine. That kind of big hyperbole can come across to some people as confidence, but for a majority of people, that kind of hyperbole and inflated talk just sounds a little desperate. Like, we all know There are going to be other novels I will read in my lifetime. Your book might be nice. I might enjoy it. But at the end of the day, I'm not giving up reading for the rest of time just because you said yours is really good. A warrior customer does not want to be disappointed. Now, you can't control some of that because some people are so deeply negative. They're so ingrained in that that they're going to find a problem with any of this stuff. But for the most part, 
a warrior needs their skepticism, their doubt overcome. You got to build a bridge and get past it. So how do we do that? We reassure. Hey, you're probably thinking that, you know, you've probably gotten a million, you probably get a million ads in your inbox every day. Why on earth would you click on this one? Well, let me tell you. And then you launch into some explanation as to why they should say yes. You want to make the risk or the, I'm going to use air quotes, the danger they think the sale has, you want to make that as accessible as possible. You want to talk right about it. You're probably thinking that this price tag of, I'm going to make a number up, $10 for this book is too much. Let me tell you why and how I got to $10. It's because of one, two, three, four, five, however many reasons. Or you might think it's crazy I'm selling this video on my website for for $15. Here's why. Because maybe they think the price tag is too high or they think that the video is too short and you want to tell them what's going on. Like you want to figure out what they think is risky about this and do something about it. You can't change the material. They might look at your fantasy novel and think, "Eh, this fantasy novel might not be great. Like you can't rewrite your book for every single person who's going to like possibly buy your book. So sometimes in your sales copy, sit down and address the fear of you're, you're probably thinking about buying this book. Let me tell you why it's a great idea. Reassurance, reassurance, reassurance all day long. Reassurance super helps. It does not necessarily mean that you blow smoke up their ass. It does not necessarily mean that you go on and on and on and beat so many dead horses. It just means you reassure them that they won't be disappointed. It feels a little tedious sometimes. It feels like you're doing a lot of hand-holding for very little like return. You just want $4 and it feels like you're you know coddling this person. Yeah, to some degree you are. But at the same time, this is how we make the sale with these kinds of people. It happens. And after a while, you'll start framing your sales copy and your pitches to give that reassurance without having to do anything extra. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's get through all six types, then I'll tell you how to build like collective strategies to deal with stuff. On we go. The friend. These are the ones that are kind of tricky to talk about because they're the customer who wants more than X. They want to know you. They want to be on the inside. They want to feel special. They want to be able to, on some degree, say, I know them. And it gets a little parasocial. This is, this is where the creepy shit happens if it goes too far. But, The customer who wants to friend you, not because they want to like get free shit from you, but the customer who wants to friend you is looking for an extreme level of reassurance because they're looking to build a stronger relationship with you. You know, they'll stick with you for a while if you're, you know, cool, which sounds very juvenile. I'm trying to find a a, a less teenage high school y way of saying it, but really, uh, they will stick with you through thick and thin so long as you verify that you know you're not a jerk. To do that, you want to make sure you're always sincere whenever possible. That you're just you. You're not putting on the manufactured, I'm now putting on the professional hat and I will sound a certain way and I will speak differently than I normally do and I will go out of my way to appear as though I am a business person. Like you don't, you don't want to not be you. You don't want to put on some kind of fake persona in order to engage with these people because they are looking for the exact opposite of that. They are looking for reality. They are looking for you to be you who happens to have made stuff. And they want that stuff. However, over time, you can question, given the way the friend customer type works, you can question if they're really here for the book or the photos or whatever at all. Maybe there's a, they have a greater need. Maybe they're, you know, they're here because you're selling birdhouses, but what they really want is someone to um, not only provide birdhouses, but also give them some kind of evidence or permission for them to be creative too. They're looking for something beyond X. 
you'll have to feel out what it is you, you know they're looking for based on their interactions with you so being perceptive on that level is not a bad idea but by and large it's not always about x the thing you're selling they're looking for you to be you and engage with you on that level this is these are the people who um in some circles would often be referred to as reply guys if they if this gets taken to an extreme but by and large, this is somebody who's looking for a person first and a product producer second and then going from there. What you want to do from a commercial transactional standpoint is keep an eye out for all the things to indicate opportunity or leverage. The ability for you to say, ah, you're talking about, you know, wanting somebody to encourage you. So, hey, you know, I'm working on my next book and I'm working on this book and you're working on your book. We can keep each other accountable. Not like you need to invite them over to your house every morning, but you can offer that sense of accountability without performing the act of accountability and it will encourage them and then they'll keep sticking with you. The friend is a tricky customer type, frankly, because after a while, it does stop being about whatever you're selling. And it sort of sits in this weird limbo space where a lot of creatives feel very awkward about it because you might not have anything to sell. Once they buy the book once, what are they going to buy like multiple copies of it a week just because? No, probably not. They're going to look and go, well, here's one book. I own it. Now what? And keeping them interested is a matter of understanding that they're looking for something more than the book. The book was their permission slip or their, their, their golden ticket to start this engagement, to start connecting with you. So what else you got? Have other things in the pipeline, whether that's more product or whether that's more opportunity or whether that's more whatever. You want it straightforward. Always keep an eye out for how you can better connect with everybody, particularly the friend type. And now we get into type number six, the last of our six customer types, who I call the committed, not committed. These are the people who don't fit any other category. You can stamp them with a maybe maybe they'll do something, but more than likely this customer isn't going to do anything. You will bombard them with sales links. You will share posts and mention things and encourage and do all the good stuff you could do, but they're just not going to function like other customers. They say they want to buy. They say it's really important, but for whatever reason, they don't. And they have, once you ask them, Plenty of reasons, I'm putting reasons in air quotes because sometimes it's legit and sometimes it's not, but they have plenty of reasons why they just pos they can't. And this ranges from everything from, well, you know, next payday, next payday I'm coming and I'm buying something. Oh, you know, for Christmas I'm, I'm coming around. Oh, beginning of the month I'll do it. There's plenty of reasons, but most of the time they just want to be in the orbit. They just want to be around you. They just want to like be in the space but they're not going to engage without specific, tailored, highly personal motivation. So let's say there's one person who you know has been on your email list forever. Let's call them, let's just make up a name. Uh, let's call them Kevin because Kevin is frequently a name I use for my examples. So let's say uh, Kevin has been on the newsletter chain for years since day one even but kevin's never bought a thing you know kevin's read your emails you can track that gabriel please go get some sleep absolutely positively rest you have no need to stay up for this it'll be on youtube tomorrow i appreciate you being here i am streaming tomorrow there is the writer's chat tomorrow this uh it'll be earlier in the day for sure it'll be at 1 p.m eastern I'll be right here. Um, coming back to here with my customers, the committed, not committed won't answer. They'll just sit there. And you know that they'll be there. You know that they'll persist. But until you sit down and individually say to them, hey, Kev, what's up, man? 
you're you're going to be hard pressed to do that. And if you have, let's say, a very large list over thirty people, fifty people, a hundred people, a thousand people, or whatever, you can't individual. You, there's not enough time in the day for you to do all the things you need to do, and individually sit down and express to them, hey, you guys should buy stuff. You can't personalize messages to everybody. One of the problems is that people count on that. So they, so they, they, the people who produce content, content creators of whatever kind, know that there's going to be more people who don't do anything than people who do stuff. And they begin to get a little desperate. And they begin to start just kind of large broadcasting what they seem to be very personal material. Like, hey, and then they write something very, like you'll see this with sex workers, for instance. Sex workers will, will send a lot of just random posts to solicit attention like, hey, babe, hey, honey, et cetera, et cetera. Even though they've never spoken to you before, you've never engaged with them beyond like a basic hi, how are you kind of a thing. But in order for them to get your attention and your uh, transaction going, they will grab for something that is immediately beyond casual. They'll go for something maybe intimate, maybe evocative, maybe a little bit farther into the engagement chain. We'll talk about engagement chains in a second. But they'll, they'll overreach. And that's going to take a customer who's on the fence and push them away. Because all of a sudden, this person's coming at me with a, hey, honey, I don't, I don't know you. That's, that's not going to work. You can't force a committed, non-committed customer into action by being aggressive. You have to just count on the fact that at some point, you just keep putting out the hook, you keep putting out the content, you keep producing stuff, you keep just being you and, and doing stuff. Either they will make a choice because you can't control them. We don't have mind control powers. They will make a choice to make a purchase or they won't. And you have to be okay with that. Those are the six customer types. Now, I want to wind back for a minute because there's a couple more concepts I want to talk about. And the first, I don't have a graphic for this. I'm out of graphics. But the first thing I want to talk about beyond this are called engagement chains also called chains of engagement. A chain of engagement or an engagement chain, they're the same thing, is the way we build a bridge from us, the maker of stuff, to them, the buyer of stuff. And it starts initially as a, tr a purely transactional relationship. I have a thing, I'm selling a thing, you give me money, you get a thing. There's very low intimacy as we begin because I don't really know you. I don't know your name. I don't, I don't know what you're into. I just know that you, you maybe like my book, hopefully. But over time, through repeated exposure, through more content, through more talking, through more whatever, we can deepen that engagement. We can push that intimacy. We're not like asking, you know, can I name my firstborn child after you or something? But we're building some kind of awareness of one another beyond just the idea of I have thing, you have money, we swap. You're soliciting their name. You're writing content that resonates with them. Your material are getting liked and favorited by them consistently. You're producing and saying stuff. And over time, you can pull information from people like their first name or some fact about them, maybe what they do for a living or you know what they're into in whatever way, shape, or form that might be. You're getting to know them on some level. Now, maybe the relationship just has one step and you go from, hi, I have a thing, let me buy a thing, to, hi, what's your name or where are you from? But maybe over time, if you're very particularly good at this and you can get good at this with practice, you can deepen that engagement chain so that you know, oh my God, that's Michelle. Michelle's bought every single one of my books and she's you know, listened to all my podcasts and she's written me two great emails. You get to know these people. That matters. That, that's a thing. You want to aim for that. You can't guarantee it for everybody, but you want to aim for it at least more than a few times because those people with whom you have greater engagement because you've gotten to know them, while I can't recommend you always start your emails to that level of customer as, hey, baby, but 
with that, with some level of intimacy, you can guarantee that those people will buy the next thing you have. It's how you lay the foundation of an active community. It's how you lay the foundation for a growing fan base. Because there is a core of people who are just going to show up and do the purchasing. And you, we, we can use them for testimonials, which are going to help the people who are on the fence. And we can use them as case studies. So we can give something to the researchers. We can use them as evidence to push against the contrarian by comparing the customer who's just like you and doubted everything. And now look at Michelle, our sample customer. She's bought the last five things. Building a relationship with your people, whomever they might be, wherever they are, comes down to actually going out and making an effort to connect with them. So on your platform, whatever it is, you have to use it for more than just producing the link you're producing. The link needs to be there at some point. We need to get them to do something, a call to action. But we also need to talk to them in a way that engages them. We need to ask them how they're doing and wait for a response and then not just have a conversation where we are sitting and waiting for our turn to talk, but we are actively listening. We are actively engaging. We are producing material that we think can speak to a problem they have or answer a question they've asked. And sometimes that means asking, hey, person over there, do you have any questions? That matters. You build that relationship through time. You build that relationship through effort. It's a lot of work. And for many, many creatives, it can feel like it's way more work than it is sort of reward for that work. I'm going to send 22 messages on, on social media platform and two emails. And yeah, I might get a couple hundred people buying a book or even five people buying a thing or downloading a thing. But it feels like I did six hours worth of prep for five sales. How is that possibly balanced? Oh, excuse me, balanced. And let me tell you, um, it's not, and it's not going to be balanced. It's never going to be balanced. The way this whole transactional system is built, balance is impossible. It just, it just doesn't do that. Don't think of this in terms of, I want to be able to write one post or one tweet or one sky skeet or whatever they call it. I want to write one thing and then just have that get all my sales. Those days are gone. That doesn't work anymore. Assume that no one-to-one relationship or, or two-to-one or three-to-one relationship exists. Everybody's going to be different, so this needs to be a regular investment of time. Whether that's I'm on this social media platform from this hour to this hour, and I'm, I'm not only talking about, well, buy my book, buy my book, buy these photos, buy this thing, check this out, check this out. You're not repeating yourself like, 8 million times. What you're doing instead is saying, hey, in between me saying I, I got this thing, like we'll use me as an example again. When I was promoting this workshop, I, I wrote one post or two posts, I think, and I mentioned it was tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then in between that, I talked to other people about other stuff. I asked them about their dog. I cared about, you know, how they were doing at work. I asked somebody today what they're, you know, why they liked coffee more than tea because I, I don't understand. Like, I was a person who also happened to be doing a thing that I wanted somebody to come and check out. That matters. That's, that's critical. Because if you are just somebody who's using a platform, whether it's a newsletter or whether it's social media or whether it's something else, and you are just only putting out links and basic calls to action. Buy my thing. Here's a new thing. Buy it. Sign up for this thing. After a while, a majority of your customer base, even the ones who are kind of sort of on the fence, they're going to stop responding because you will have only conditioned them to expect one point of contact from you. Every time I get an email from this person, they're selling me something. You set up that pattern, which means you get to break that pattern. And here's how we break that pattern. And then we'll get out of here in just about, I don't know, a few minutes. We'll be less than an hour tonight. You break that pattern by accounting for your customer types and knowing that not every part of every email or every post needs to address every single customer type. 
Sometimes you're going to write a thing, a post, an email, a newsletter, whatever, that is only going to speak to contrarians. And the contrarians will pay attention and other people will pay less attention. Although it is possible that what you're aiming for one group will also, you know, affect other groups because nobody lives in a vacuum. But while you're addressing the researcher with data, you might also get some people who are excited about this new thing and they'll just say yes to it. There is crossover potential. But in order to do this, you need the discipline to vary up how you approach. So, yeah, sometimes you're going to write emails or posts that, you know, aren't always going to reach people. I write a ton of stuff that goes nowhere. It gets seen by people. I know it does. But, like, out of 100 people who read it, maybe five people click a link. And that sucks. I hate it. It makes me feel terrible about myself. But that's the nature of this beast. That's how this stuff works. You just have to keep trying. And then maybe I'll try something radically different and six different people will say yes on the next one. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. And then I'll do it again and the numbers will always vary. Mix up your approaches to cast the widest net possible wherever possible, knowing that no po- no, no post, no email, no nothing is perfect and anybody selling you a perfect template or a mastermind amazing foolproof system is selling you something and lying to you and you should ignore them and avoid them like the plague. What you want to do instead is have these tools in your toolbox. Know when you can reach a researcher, know how to engage the people who just want to be friends, know the people who are committed to being not committed and know how to talk to them. Send an email that, you know, encourages reassurance Send an email that encourages data. Um, something like that works. Okay. That is everything I have in 51 minutes. I want to thank everybody for being here. I apologize for it kind of being brief and a little bit wobbly, but this was my first attempt at a verbal version of this newsletter. So I want to thank everybody for checking this out. I will see you guys tomorrow right here at 7 p.m. Eastern uh, for the writer's chat. Uh, the Q, if you don't know what that is, that's the Q&A where I answer questions from all kinds of writers about all kinds of stuff. I want to thank you for being here tonight, and I will see you guys tomorrow. This will be on YouTube uh, within a couple hours, if not well before the writer's chat, that's for sure. Okay, guys, have a great night. I'll talk to you soon. See ya.